um, start here. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Vanessa. I coordinate the Cork Smart Gateway. This is an initiative that it was established by Cork City Council, Cork County Council, UCC, CIT, and the Tyndall National Institute. Um, this initiative aims to support Cork and enhance the reputation of Cork as a place to work, as a place to visit, uh, study, and work and invest here. And um, but also focusing in Cork as a smart region. As my region that also supports a large number of organizations that are working on smart solutions uh, for the physical realm of the of the region and um, also to the digital digitalization part of businesses and other type of organizations. Um, this webinar and the initiative is also supported by Enable, uh, the Enable Research Program that connects communities with the smart urban environments through IoT. So that being said, this webinar is the second webinar of a webinar series that we've prepared for all of you and it will be focused on augmented reality and virtual reality transforming businesses. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Dave Alton here. He is uh, going to be the moderator of the webinar. Dave is a marketing lecturer in UCC and also has uh, his research and interest on digital strategies and on modern technologies such as the AR and VR that we're going to be addressing in this webinar. So welcome and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Hi guys, so welcome to the Cox Market Way webinar. Um, so I suppose we all know that I suppose the adoption and development of technology has become more proficient and has pr proliferated in the last number of months in particular due to the COVID-19. And today we're going to talk specifically about augmented and virtual reality technologies. So within this particular space, I suppose we all know a number of industries and technologies that have developed over the last number of years. So in particular esports, for example, is still one of the fastest growing industries in the world where AR and VR has become very, very proficient. And even more recently, as a couple of weeks ago, we had Apple um, launching the iPhone 12 where they have included LiDAR technologies, which is going to enable more immersive experiences when it comes to AR and VR. But I suppose beyond that, which I find quite interesting is that a lot of commentators, academics, industry, and so on and so forth have kind of wrote off AR and VR and that it's a fad or a trend and I suppose what's going to be interesting today is listening to our speakers who are at the coal face of this looking at where this technology is going where it's going to be applied and how it's going to develop and be really really useful in the future so I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to introduce the first um, speaker so the first speaker is uh, Dr. Kieran Delaney from the Nimbus Research Center He's a senior research fellow at the Nimbus Research Center and Cork Institute of Technology. His main interests are in exploring the challenges emerging in human machine interaction, the impact of technology trends such as Internet of Things and investigating new approaches to addressing some of these challenges in practice. His background is in microelectronics. He graduated with a PhD from UCC in 1997 and has worked in Tyndall uh, before working with uh, before moving to CIT, where he has been a key contributor to the foundation of the Nimbus Centre and Industry Gateway. He has coordinated numerous H2020 projects, currently including um, uh, Fit for FOF, which is developing new workplace education and training solutions for the factory of the future. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dr. Kieran Delaney and he's going to present um, his work. Sorry about that. I was on mute. On mute. Um, thank you very much. I am um, going to basically uh, give an overview of some of the work that's being done uh, within CIT um, as a kind of framework for, for talking a little bit about um, how the, the, the process of bringing the physical world and the virtual world together can be exploited in the workplace. And we'll see examples of that later on in the presentation um, and, and in the webinar. Um, and I suppose 
One of the things to start with is if we look at what's happened in the last number of months, there's been a massive shift uh, because we have to um, distance physically and socially in order to address and the, the challenge of COVID. And we've had to find new ways of applying what we're doing and um, to um, uh, shift our focus and, and really remote solutions have really been a serious part of that, but it's been quite disruptive. We've, we've, we've all transitioned very fast and, and very quickly. Um, so in that context, um, we, we, we've perhaps seen a really good example of where um, remote systems and online solutions like AR and VR can come in and fill gaps, not necessarily replace the face-to-face -face value and the, the, the importance of what we do when, when, we're, when we're together, but to find ways to kind of augment and, and, and reframe that, um, given that many things are not possible now. The backdrop for what um, CIT has been doing has really been built over the course of about 10 years um, through a series of initiatives um, within the Nimbus Centre, but also working across the, 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 the faculties of engineering and business and humanities, looking at creative approaches um, to use augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and really, we've been looking at let's say the concept of what is now called digital twinning for quite a while, where you, where you essentially build a virtual version of uh, the physical entity. And, and you, you use that virtual version to interpret what's going on in the physical world. Um, and that process is really about developing strategies around how you manage data coming from the physical world, visualize it, and then feed back um, the results of that visualization, the participation with the, 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 the humans involved in the loop uh, to get a value add and to get um, a, a, a better level of control in, with, with, with the physical world. So some of the examples of what we've been doing in, in, involve um, what are effectively uh, practices for twinning um, everyday objects in, in, in um, office type spaces and then determining how to how to manage the data and and how the two of them will work side by side you know so on the left you have examples of this from uh, um, seven or eight years ago um, where we we built from scratch a number of everyday tools and and furniture and and objects like that and this has transitioned to to immersive solutions um, looking at um, exercise, looking at the impact of um, using uh, uh, virtual reality as a support for training and for um, the uh, uh, sort of well-being challenge that, and, and again, what you're doing here is you're managing the, 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 the different forms of data that are coming through um, and trying to visualize them and, and, and in real time um, augment the experience. Um, and this has transitioned through other other work that's been done within CIT, um, which is really trying to augment um, everyday physical spaces. Um, so from a practical point of view, uh, we've done initiatives across a number of um, programs with sensors like the Nagel Center um, to, to, to build this augmentation process. And what's grounding all of this is really exploring how to apply this um, and engage, um, let's say, all of the human senses. So, um, yeah, audio and video, yes? Sorry to interrupt, but um, it's only the first slide that we're looking at. Are you moving? I am. Because, um, yeah, like, I think it stopped or. Okay, there's something wrong with the, the screen. Um, can you see a change there? Yeah, now we're in the second, sorry. Ah, okay, okay, no, no, thank you for that. Okay, so um, sorry about that. There's just a, a, a problem with the the setup here. Now, Vanessa, is that is that clearer? No, it's showing just like one part, and in a really bad. Um, uh, it's. Okay, tell you what I'll do. I'll stop the share and I'll start again because I, 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 I think... Would you like me to help you with that? Um, yes. Okay. Let's see. And, uh... Okay. 
Okay. Now, how is that? Yeah, there we can look at it. Good. Perfect. Okay, so I just need to go back. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I, I won't revisit from, from, from scratch, but basically um, what we have is, is um, a, 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 a combination of different skill sets coming together. And this is an important part of the whole process. Um, in managing kind of a, a, a process that combines um, the physical world with the digital world, you're inherently looking at a multidisciplinary initiative. Um, where what really should drive this is the understanding of the physical world, the data that's relevant in that space, and then how the virtualization process can drive and enable that. Um, so the, 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 the process of bringing that together is, is, is something um, that needs to be looked at when you're trying to apply these solutions. Um, some examples of the work that's been done um, through, through initiatives with, with, within the, 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 the faculties include um, looking at uh, virtual reality experiences in real world environments like uh, shopping centers, um, looking at how virtual reality and augmented reality in combination with haptics can support um, access and support a better experience. And, 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 and these two examples, the, the previous one and this one are really about um, uh, looking at things like disability and looking at exploring uh, physical movement in combination with, with virtual worlds um, where you were mapping a virtual picture of the world um, to um, a physical space. And then looking at challenges like how the um, the impact of of of, of the the virtual reality affected um, uh, the 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 user and did did it in, um, induce a sense of nausea? Was 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 there a, a negative physical experience coupled to to the virtualization approach? And working through that. Um, like a, a key element of that are the series of practices, the piloting and the testing that really goes with, 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 with uncovering the correct critical paths to apply. Um, and, and this kind of brings um, uh, us to sort of the, the sort of recent initiatives within the, um, uh, the, the within CIT and within, within uh, Nimbus um, around um, applying these various different um, innovation approaches. Um, so bringing together these different skill sets and um, the multidisciplinary disciplinary approach into a space that can enable the new technologies to be applied and also meet um, implementations in the physical space. So from that point of view, uh, what's being brought together now um, in, in, I suppose, response to the general trend of new um, data interaction mechanisms becoming more part and parcel of our everyday lives, but accelerated by the impact of COVID um, is what we're calling the, the Extended Reality Innovation Lab. Um, so this is a physical space. It combines uh, the virtual toolkit and the augmented reality toolkit with the ability to test and assess. And um, it's applied in a way that's safely monitored and controlled. So you can imagine this is a space where you can come in and test these solutions and apply the kind of technologies that you'll see later in the webinar um, and work them into the processes that are part of your target application, whether it's something you're looking to assemble and sell externally or whether it's something that needs to be brought into an existing process to enhance what you're already doing or fill a gap that, for example, has emerged due to, to something like the, the, the recent COVID crisis. So the idea is that this brings together both the, 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 the physical technical capabilities and also the resources and the skill sets, the know-how uh, that goes with that in order to enable these solutions to be found, tested and applied. You know, so this works across quite a lot of different domain areas. One of the, the richest um, uh, um, areas of richest potential at the moment is the kind of smart manufacturing industry 4.0 space where um, a lot of the let's say maturing assessment of how these would be used is 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 
um, grounding and becoming um, uh, sort of opening out in, in terms of um, augmented solutions being really good for troubleshooting, for automation and maintenance, um, as well as a clear benefit in training. Um, using immersive solutions um, which are mapped into digital twins of real factory processes um, to enable um, as immersive and, and, and practical as possible um, training mechanisms to be applied. Um, and I suppose as part of the projects that I've been involved in and, 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 and the, the projects that are looking to address digital transformation in this space, we've seen a really rapid change to AR, VR approaches. Um, and one of the important elements of this is that um, the larger companies are going through quite a structured process of assessing exactly how applied um, approaches to AR and VR will come in. So, so really it is looking at a lean solution to apply AR, VR most effectively um, and um, to meet a set of specific targets. So those mechanisms which larger companies can apply also need to be translated to approaches that SMEs and smaller companies can, 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 can leverage. Um, so this is one of the reasons that the lab is coming into being, um, to facilitate that and to enable not alone individual companies to, to, to leverage these technologies, but to make sure that um, a, a sort of a, a, a level of scale can be applied to this and, and pooled resources across and around supply chains can be leveraged um, to support and build this into the, 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 the practical development of these AR, VR solutions. Um, the case, um, is essentially it feeds on a, 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 a series of immersive AR, VR approaches. Um, so the, 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 the whole idea is to build a lab that people can come in and apply in different ways. It can also be supplemented by a different, uh, additional material, different VR toolkits. Um, you know, so so it, it's flexible in that format, which it will need to be. Um, and, and, and the whole idea of, 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 of this is, is actually with a strong eye on the needs of, of SMEs um, in making sure that uh, these uh, um, approaches uh, can, can be leveraged. And we're seeing first quite a lot of movement in the learning and trading space, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, um, but also a lot of uh, workplace initiatives um, uh, and along the lines of what, what, our, what our later speakers will talk about are, are very central. Um, and, and a key element of this is mapping the technical requirements to the process and then working through the user experience. So what it says on the tin in terms of um, the, the expected outcomes are actually what happens. And also that you can get a, a better grasp of the unforeseen consequences associated with these uh, new technologies and how they're applied in, in the workplace. And, and, and these kinds of um, uh, test spaces really offer a way of mediating that between um, the, the what's what's going on in, in on on at the design stage and and what ultimately um, is 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 critically active with within within the actual workplace. So that that's that's the kind of quick drive through what what uh, CIT and Nimbus have been doing. Um, so thank you very much, and and um, uh, Vanessa, I'll hand back to you. Thanks very much, Kieran. That was really, really interesting. So, just for everyone who's uh, who's uh, who's joined the webinar, we're going to wait until the very end, and then we're going to have a Q and A session with all the panelists, um, all the panelists combined. So, uh, if you could turn off your camera, please, and then if Dar O'Brien and Fergal Kelly from DigiSoft Soft could turn on theirs. So, to introduce both, um, uh, directing client consultancy activities at DigiSoft, Dara has gained valuable insight into what shapes the life sciences, telecoms, media, tourism, and industrial sectors with an ambition to ensure that DigiSoft can pioneer and deliver the right products and solutions into markets that are undertaking digital transformation initiative. Dara holds a BSc in computer applications from Cork Institute of Technology. 
Secondly, if I introduce Fergal Kelly, Fergal joined Digisoft in 2012 after seven years with Kit Digital and I co um, running media solutions and partnerships. Kelly has 18 years experience in the media sector, focusing predominantly on VOD systems, DRM broadcasting and interactive television. Kelly has been influential in industry thinking and research via publications and talks. He is a regular conference speaker and contributor to media forums, also advising institutional investment groups. He holds a BSc from the University of Manchester and a HCI Master's from the University of London. So I'd like to welcome you both. And if you want to start your presentation, then feel free. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, happy Thursday. Uh, I'm Fergal Kelly from Digisoft, and uh, we're going to talk to you today about some of our experiences with virtual reality in Ireland over the last nine months. Uh, Digisoft has been around 20 years in various guises. Uh, we've been delivering digital multimedia platforms for most of that time. Uh, we started off in, in television and broadcasting with red button type services, and we've transitioned through cultural and tourism type interactive media platforms all the way through to industrial and life science platforms with pharmaceutical companies in Ireland. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dara now and he's going to explain to you some of our experiences. Uh, thank you Fergal. Uh, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the learnings we've had over the last number of months when it comes to deploying virtual reality solutions to some of our enterprise customers and, and business customers in both the industrial and tourism sectors. Um, I suppose when we talk about virtual reality in the workplace, to date what we've seen a lot of is uh, computer generated imagery, virtual environments, uh, you know, not too dissimilar to, to a gaming environment. Um, and this type of virtual environment is, is very beneficial to give people uh, you know, real world type of scenario experience um, you know, and, and training. It's very much been a, a training uh, and orientation tool for uh, learning how to do uh, new tasks in, in a safe environment. Um, so since, since March, since COVID hit, um, what we've seen in, in businesses is that there has been an accelerated adoption of digital transformation initiatives. Um, you know, the, to date, uh, some, some innovative companies have been adopting these new virtual reality technologies, uh, augmented reality, um, you know, implementing initiatives around digital transformation. Um, but, but other companies have, have often been slow to, I suppose, make the jump and, uh, and, and try to build a more efficient business using digital technologies. So COVID, um, one of the silver linings, I guess, of COVID is that, you know, businesses have been, been forced to uh, take the plunge into using digital technologies uh, for business continuity. Um, we've seen how remote working has, you know, I suppose reduced technophobia in people that otherwise might have been slow to uh, use these new technologies that are at their disposal. Um, and so it has encouraged participation in digital, in using digital tools as, as we're seeing here today, in fact. Um, so there have been positive trends uh, with, with, with the pandemic. Um, and we're going to see now uh, how virtual reality has fared uh, since then. Um, <clears throat> so virtual reality uh, as one of the digital transformation toolkits has been on the radar of, of larger enterprises um, you know, to date, um, predominantly you know, in manufacturing uh, areas where, where people can learn to, to, to do new tasks uh, using this technology. But we're also going to see uh, how it can apply to the, the SME sector in, in, a, in a more affordable manner as well. Um, so as mentioned, virtual reality traditionally involves what we call scenario-based training for high-risk activities. Um, so there's many advantages to using this technology. Um, you know, it, it can recreate real-life situations, recreate realistic scenarios. Um, 
it leads to better learning retention as well. Uh, you know, we've seen from uh, the cone of experience that people remember 10% of what they read, but they remember 90% of what they actually do. Um, we also need to consider the workforce of the future, uh, millennials and, and the upcoming Gen Zs. Um, PowerPoint doesn't cut it for this, this demographic anymore. Um, you know, immersive, engaging experiences is what's expected uh, from this, this up and coming workforce in order for them to learn how to do uh, the new digital roles for the smart worker that, that's going to be making up the future in, in manufacturing. Um, you know, people can practice the skills and their learnings in a virtual environment in, in, a, in a safe manner without fear of consequences. And this is particularly uh, useful and beneficial in high risk areas. You know, imagine health and safety training for fire suppression uh, or working at heights, things like this. You know, there's, there's, before people actually go and do the, the job for real, they can learn and repeat over and over with, with, without any, any uh, risk. Um, again, with COVID, uh, remote working is a, is a thing now. So, you know, can we use this technology uh, at home? Yes, we can. It can be utilized any anytime, anywhere, any place. So it, it marries very well with the new way of working where the workforce may be distributed uh, outside of the, the home base of an organization. And what we're seeing as well as time moves on is that uh, virtual reality technology is becoming more and more affordable, um, you know, to the degree that it is, uh, you know, affordable to, to mainstream uh, and it's not just a realm of uh, high tech, uh, big business any, anymore. So what have we learned about the path that VR has been taking in enterprise since COVID? broke out? Well, there's been a couple of different, uh, I suppose, changes to the, the trajectory of virtual reality and the, um, you know, how fast it's being adopted. I suppose one, one concern um, is now uh, the sharing of equipment. Um, what's been happening in, in industry to date is that typically uh, virtual reality set headsets have been procured and then on site they have been utilized by the workforce and shared among the workforce you know so in an organization you know there may be a fleet of five or ten headsets and then uh, you know up to 50 or 60 employees would use them depending on what training needs to be done so uh, you know that sharing of equipment is now probably going to be a bit of a challenge um going forward um you know uh, because of covid and, and social distancing etc um, so what, what we're going to see is that, you know, people may need to uh, have their own personal devices with which to, to utilize virtual reality training. And of course, that's going to be expensive to scale to large workforces. Um, so, so that is a challenge and, and we're yet to see exactly how that is going to play out. Um, but as I mentioned, that the cost of technology is, is coming down. Um, the refresh time is decreasing, meaning there's, there's newer versions and variants of the technology coming out all the time. Um, but this does also lead to a, a lag in people adopting if they're waiting for the next best thing to see what's coming next. Um, however, um, because of COVID, because of the, I suppose, the, the forced nature of having to adjust work practices, we have seen an appetite for, for businesses to innovate and or try to uncover new ways of, of working um, for the future. But with workplaces and you know, in particular industrial and manufacturing workplaces, only allowing essential employees on site to do the, the core manufacturing jobs, um, there's actually less opportunity now to socialize virtual reality in the workplace. Previously, um, colleagues would have socialized this type of technology together when, when they met uh, you know, at their office, tried it out, um, encouraged their colleagues to use it, etc. So, so that's a little bit more difficult now uh, with everybody working uh, in a dispersed manner. Um, however, it is apparent now to us from what the work we've been doing with our clients that there are means of virtually accessing accessing these real uh, virtual worlds um, 
in other manners. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, digital twins and our concept of a 3D virtual twin. Um, so that is something that encompasses the experience of a built space, whether it's a manufacturing floor or a museum uh, or an office space, you know, on these virtual reality headsets. But we also make them available and these immersive virtual experiences available for adoption by a more general and wider audience that don't necessarily have access to the headsets. Um, so what, what does this mean we can enable now for, for businesses? Uh, that want to uh, adopt uh, virtual technology, virtual reality technology. Well, now it means that tourists can now virtually visit museums that, that are closed. Um, and we're going to see some examples of that later. You know, new employees can train in preparation for their re return to work, even if they don't have uh, access to a headset. Um, contractors that need to uh, service and maintain uh, factories can survey the job sites before needing to actually physically visit the site as, as access may be restricted. Um, and managers who are working from home can remotely monitor in real time the status of the production lines in a, in a visually and contextually meaningful way. The virtual reality that we enable with our CyberTwin platform, it's not just about headsets anymore. It spans a whole range of ubiquitous devices, you know, everything from tablets, PCs, and mobile phones, uh, to the latest generation of headsets, but also devices like large touch screens that can be shared and uh, given as a collaborative environment uh, and interacted with um, by, by multiple people. We started building virtual reality uh, solutions for museums as a niche marketing tool for the venue sales teams to take to um, trade shows and events um, to promote their product uh, to, to um, travel agents and, and, and tour, tour companies. Um, but since COVID and the closure of these tourist attractions, that same content, that same experience is now used by the general public as a virtual tourism experience. And it has become part of the, the modern travel industry zeitgeist. You know, while all these venues are closed, they're still open to the public, albeit in a, in a virtual manner. Likewise, in industry, beyond just training tools and, and training use cases, these 3D digital spaces that have been built, and they're oftentimes they're, they're photorealistic, photo so they're, they're an accurate representation of, of what actually exists, as opposed to a computer-generated uh, image uh, like you might see in a game. Um, they're being used across the business now by employees who have, um, who no longer have access to, to the shop floor. Um, so as the term has been coined as industrial tourism, as this goes virtual, uh, there is also a secondary sustainability impact to the reduction of physical visits to high-tech production facilities. You know, prior to COVID, uh, many high-tech businesses, manufacturing businesses, pharmaceutical companies um, had, had an, a need to um, bring stakeholders of the business on tours of their facilities and whether that was customers or colleagues from other sites or indeed uh, research institutes and, and, and uh, educational institutes um, any kind of visitors they, they often spent a, a lot of time and energy um, giving physical tours and, and, and this had the, the impact of um, you know, potentially disrupting production uh, while these tours were ongoing. Um, so now these tours can be done virtually, um, but also they can, they can save on um, you know, not flying people around the world. Um, so, so I'd say there's a, there's a green uh, impact as well to doing these tours virtually. Um, you, know, you can do virtual guided tours that can complement those physical tours that may have to take place, but it does reduce travel. It can give you a more personalized visitor experience depending on the, the type of visitor and the demographic of the visitor. And, and it's a fantastic tool for preparing employees for upcoming audits as they can practice their, their auditing uh, responses in this virtual environment. Beyond just giving tours of, of these uh, virtual spaces, you know, from a monitoring and operational point of view, you, you can see in real time, you know, the the status and the progress of the production, uh, you know, monitor the, 
the sensors that, that are delivering data in the system. And, and this, this is part of the industrial internet of things and industry 4.0 that is now becoming a thing in, in, in industry and manufacturing. On the tourism side, uh, we've worked with EPIC, the Irish Emigration Museum, for a number of years now, as I mentioned, uh, with virtual reality solutions. And they've gone from using it uh, for their marketing activities to it being the primary means of engagement during COVID. And even this year, with them being closed, they still managed to, to win Europe's leading uh, tourist attraction, which, which I must say is, is some, some feat. Um, so, so the message is that virtual reality is here now, and it is more accessible than you may have expected, just not perhaps in the form you may have expected. Um, so I'm just gonna show a, a video now of, of what that looks like and uh, give, give you a sense of, of how these immersive experiences ca can look and feel. So just to, to wrap up, um, CyberTwin is our digital 3D visualization platforms and it assists uh, production managers and operators and digital transformation leaders and anybody who wants to uh, implement digital transformation strategies uh, so that they can ensure a safe working environment and they can eliminate unnecessary visitors to their facilities and therefore reduce the risk of contamination and downtime and, and decrease yield. Um, and building upon our success with Epic and a soon to be announced new visitor experience with Nano Nagle Place here in Cork City, Culture Twin is our new virtual tour platform for the tourism and hospitality industry to support business continuity in these uncertain times. Um, so, so thank you for listening and I'm just gonna let Fergal wrap up with any final thoughts that, that we may have. Thanks Dara. Um, as Dara said, uh, we, we're giving you an exclusive sort of preview of the NanoNagle uh, VR experience and app. Uh, you can download the app in the um, Apple and Google stores uh, at, at, in, in the normal fashion, and uh, it includes the VR tour as part of the app experience. Um, thanks for all of your time this morning, and we'll be happy to take questions at the end of the other two um, presentations. That's great, guys. Thanks very much for that. Um, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, please, and if I could invite uh, Dr. Dave Mur Murphy and uh, Elmarie McCarthy to start sharing theirs. So to introduce the next speakers, uh, Dave Murphy has been a lecturer in the School of Computer Science and Information Technology at UCC since 1998. David is currently the Program Director for the MSc in Interactive Media and the BA Digital Humanities and Information Technology at UCC. His research interests are in the areas of virtual reality and mixed reality, serious games, cognitive ergonomics and spatial sound. David is the founder of the Maverick Research Lab and is also a funded PI in the Insight Research Centre and the Connect Centre. David is also a founding member of the International Organisation of VR First and the ISO NSAI MPEG WG11 Advisory Group and is co-chair of the Universities and Colleges Committee in the International Augmented Reality and Virtual Reality Association. Elmarie McCarthy then took on the role of Tourism Officer in Cork City Council in July 2019. Based in the Strategic and Economic Development Directorate, the tourism section works in partnership with local, regional and national stakeholders to support the development of tourist products and amenities in infrastructure in the city and to promote Cork City as an attractive 
tourist destination. Elmarie has also worked in the economic development and community and enterprise sections of Cork City Council. And before joining the council, she worked in the community higher education and EU affairs sectors. So you can drive on with your presentation whenever you are ready. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, so I'll pass over to Elmarie to give a general high level overview of the project. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, as Dave mentioned, I'm kind of coming from the Cork City Council perspective. What you'll have heard from my bio is nothing relating to technology whatsoever. And that's very much the, the point at which the project started. So I just wanted to give you a little background to the context of why we felt this was something that we wanted to develop and approach TC to work ECC to work with about. And the context really was last year, in the middle of last year, when we started doing a wayfinding strategy, a visitor wayfinding strategy for Cork City. Um, this was something that had long been a goal of the City Council. We were aware that the, the direction was dated, um, had, you know, it, it really needed improving in the city centre, particularly the two chat, the two rivers and the going through the city centre disoriented people. And there were issues around people understanding what they were seeing. Um, so we developed a strategy last year and ended up with a strategy that had two key objectives. The first, I suppose, is what you would expect from a wayfinding strategy. It was around using best practice orientation and wayfinding to give visitors and residents the tools to explore the city with confidence. But the second and equally important objective, and that's the one that's relevant to this project, is the need to imbue the city streets with a unique sense of place that both captures and communicates Cork's unique character and heritage and history. So really, I suppose the thing is that it's not just signs was, was one of the key takeaways from our strategy. And then towards the end of the year, we did a number of funding applications to help us secure the funding to start to roll out the strategy and they were successful. So um, then going on to this year in terms of why augmented reality, as you would have expected, the, um, the key elements of the inner strategy are the what the mapping, the information totems and signs, where they're going, the, con the content for them. And that's the basics of any city wayfinding strategy. So that's kind of being developed right now. But we also wanted to, to identify how we could use technology to develop some special interpretive experiences that highlight Cork's unique character and heritage. And one of the images, we, we worked with some consultants last year on the development of the strategy. And one of the images in terms of potential for technology that captured people's imagination around the table was the image that you're seeing now. And I suppose the caption they had was turning your phone into a time machine. So this idea that without the need for headsets that people wandering the streets of Cork, both, lo both visitors but also locals could at certain points hold up their phone and be taken back in time and bringing the past back to life. Um, we knew there was a lot of content available um, through um, photographic archives at the National Library and also some video, old video footage of Cork um, from the early 1900s held at the British Film Institute's National Archive. So really what we wanted to do was develop a pilot project working with UCC through the, Cre through the Connect program to try to develop this, um, this pilot. And I suppose stressing that it is just a pilot for now. Also, I should have said at the start is the project is still ongoing. It's not developed yet. And Dave will talk through the specifics of that now and what, but we're not at the end point yet, although we're close. And then going forward, um, we would see this as a part of an ongoing collaboration between Cork City Council and UCC. And there's a lot of other potential applications that we see the pilot being extended to if it works as we hope and are confident that it will. Um, not least in my own field in terms of heritage and tourism applications. Um, just looking at even just an example, um, the regional park in Ballincollig and the gunpowder mills. Um, that are that are located there that the possibility is to bring that back to life and really enable people to understand um, and appreciate what it is they're walking past are huge but there's a lot of potential in that tourism and heritage sphere but also we think there's opportunities across the city council from parks arts and libraries beyond so this is very much the starting point for us so um that's just the context as a public sector of organization is why we felt it could help us enhance both residents and visitors understanding of, um, of the heritage that's around them. And it would supplement the traditional signage and panels um, and just kind of add that special experience for them. So I'm gonna hand over to David now, who's going to talk you through how the project has been developed. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So as Elmarie mentioned, uh, this is a pilot project and um, 
we are building this test bed um, to check the feasibility of um, rolling this out um, into uh, the wider population and also over time to add new capabilities and new features um, as, as we progress. So just some of the design considerations um, that we had to uh, consider when developing the system um, was that the system needed to be responsive and scale dynamically. So this is going to be deployed across the city and um, it's uh, primarily going to be accessed by mobile phone. And it, the target audience essentially is the general public. And so there you have a mix of different platforms, different devices with different capabilities. So we had to tie down as much as possible um, to come up with a, a minimum experience that most users could access and could have. So our system needed to be responsive and scale dynamically because we couldn't determine at any one point what the usage would be. Most of the processing would need to be done on the server side where possible. Again, that reflects the variation in different types of mobile phones with different capabilities different platforms, et cetera. Primarily, the system should be mobile first, needs to be responsive, and it needs to accommodate as many platforms as possible. So there are some minimum requirements for a user's end device. Um, so uh, needs to be a relatively modern smartphone, um, needs to have um, connectivity, uh, because this is location-based, and needs to have sufficient um, computational power to actually uh, process um, location information and do some um, localized rendering as well. We also envisage that this system would be multimedia rich. So it's not just the presentation of static text or static images that we wanted to incorporate um, movies and films. Um, and we also wanted to um, utilize sound and um, use as much of the multimedia as possible. Now, as systems developers, then we also have to think about the content creation. Um, even though this is a pilot project, we are developing this um, for long-term usage. So it is envisaged that the system will be renewed, the content will be renewed on an ongoing basis. So we needed to develop a solution for um, Elle Marie and her team in the city to keep the content fresh, um, keep the current the experiences current and relevant, and it allows for um, new material to be released at significant moments, um, for instance, marking various anniversaries um, or any cultural events um, in the city. With regards to the user end of the system, given the uh, the, the wide range of potential users, uh, we adopted a universal uh, de design principle approach. Um, uppermost in our mind is accessibility. Now, accessibility within reason, because we are limited to what we can achieve with the actual devices, the phones themselves. So the experience is primarily visual, but it is augmented by sound and um, tailored graphics and uh, various other mechanisms for assisting with accessibility. Um, so the application at the moment is uh, around tourism, heritage and history. So internationalization was also a key consideration and we've built the system so that it supports uh, multiple languages, so it's multilingual. And um, our intention is that when we go live soon, that it will go live both in English and Irish to begin with. As I mentioned earlier, uh, usability is a very important uh, consideration and we designed the system to reduce the cognitive friction for the end user so to make it as straightforward and as usable as possible um, without the need to refer to uh, a manual or a training um, FAQ type, type situation. So what we were aiming for is frictionless user experience so the user on site on location lifts up their phone um, enters into augmented reality and they should be able to intuitively interact with the system from there. So the solution we came up with um, 
On the technological side, with regards to the technologies, we chose web-based technologies. This was to um, avoid the need to have to build apps for different platforms, Android, iOS, etc. And then for the ongoing maintenance of these, which is a burden for anyone involved in augmented reality, virtual reality development. So it's one thing going live with the application. It's a completely different matter when you have to maintain it and keep it up to date and um, release updates on an ongoing basis. So we chose to use uh, web platforms. Um, our backend system is comprised of Node.js and MySQL, and that gives us scalability and um, has proven to be very responsive. In terms of the scene construction, and uh, most of the work is done in uh, an API called 3.js. And then we use the Wex, uh, WebXR API to enable the augmented reality functionality on the mobile phone. And one of the necessary requirements with the WebXR uh, API is that the web system um, has uh, TLS and SSL uh, security certificates. And this is there to protect um, the users because we are dealing with um, user data. So things like their location, uh, information, and so on. For uh, Elmarie and her team, uh, the subject matter experts, we chose Directus as the CMS and we have built a bespoke uh, platform around the uh, Directus um, system. And then for clients, for end users, pretty much all they need is a modern smartphone and a phone that supports the WebEx or API. Uh, of course, they also need to be connected uh, to the internet. So here are some screenshots of the um, current state of the pilot. You can see on the left, um, we have a, a live dynamic map that shows us uh, key landmarks. Um, these are identified on screen with the image inside a, um, a circle. And you'll also see binoculars inside in a, um, a circle with a blue um, outer rim. Those are vantage points or viewpoints from where you can look at the landmark. You can see an example in the center of um, information um, that's returned when pointing the phone at Cork Opera House. Um, in that panel, you've also got general information and you've got directions. So in the next slide, uh, sorry, the next image of the slide, you can see the directions being mapped out on the map. This is very similar to Google Maps or Apple Maps, and it's live and dynamic. So as you're walking around Cork City, your location information is being updated and the, the paths and um, the trails are being updated dynamically. So I mentioned earlier on uh, that the system was multilingual and um, that we adopted many um, best practices in uh, user experience design and in uh, usability for functionality. So for launch, we're going to deploy this both in English and Irish, but there's actually no limit to the number of languages that we can support. So this gives great scope to Cork City and partners to um, reach out to uh, add support for other languages. As you can see in the second uh, screenshot, we have the Opera House again, uh, this time in Irish. Um, the third screenshot shows us a, a movie. Um, that's associated with the Fort uh, statue. And um, the last screenshot there shows you the movie actually running from that particular point. Um, most of the material um, we have is historical information. So we have very early uh, movie footage and um, we have um, uh, photographs um, that go back to the, the um, last century. So I'll leave Elmarie talk about that later on. And then finally, um, to demonstrate the augmented reality experience, uh, screenshots really don't cut it because it's very difficult to convey augmented reality. So we have a very, very short movie here, which um, shows you the user's experience um, going into augmented reality. And this was taken by one of our researchers, um, shout out to uh, Billy O'Mani, um, who did this um, late yesterday evening.
Okay, so that was just a very short snippet, uh, just showing uh, uh, some of the features of the system. We haven't spoken about our walking trails um, where you can go on a guided tour or guided walk of Cork City. Um, there are other multimedia capabilities that we haven't um, um, uh, focused today, uh, including things like um, voiceovers, um, narrations, um, and um, also timeline driven uh, images and, and media. So that's okay. our system. Sorry to interrupt there. If you could finish up in the next two minutes, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So that's our system as it currently stands. We're currently in testing phase and we're hoping to go live. We're planning to go live um, early December. Okay, with that, I'll hand back over to you, Dave. Thank you. Excellent stuff. Thanks very much. So I would ask uh, Dave to please turn off his microphone. And the final speaker today is uh, Patrick Liddy from Utility AR. So Patrick is a qualified electrical engineer uh, from UCD in Dublin and holds a diploma in business from DIT. He brought innovation to the electricity market by founding Activation Energy, an energy efficiency software platform, and following an acquisition in 2014, led the company to be the largest demand response company both in Ireland and the UK. When Patrick first encountered augmented reality smart glasses, he was convinced that the technology will change how industry gets work done. In 2017, he re-entered the entrepreneurial space, founding Utility AR, an AR software developer which creates augmented reality solutions for utilities, industry and other organizations who manage large portfolios of physical assets. The company now boasts local and multinational clients in the data center, pharma and utility sectors. So Patrick, feel free to start your presentation whenever you're ready. Great. Can you confirm you can see my screen? Yeah, we're good. Terrific. Uh, okay, I'm going to take you on a very whirlwind um, uh, tour of augmented reality, give you an idea of what can be done and specifically what we as a company do. So, um, different from virtual reality, which we've heard a little bit about already, we work uh, with augmented reality glasses. So these are clear glass glasses, um, so, such that you, <coughs> you are predominantly seeing the real world when you're seeing them in a normal way, just like safety glasses. However, digital information is projected on the glass, which means you can also see um, images or videos or text or some other type of, of content. Um, so in the presentation we just saw, we saw augmented reality through a phone camera. However, with augmented reality glasses, you're just seeing the real world, but you're also seeing that digital information overlaid on it. The effect is sort of like if you leave the newspaper on the dashboard of your car, you can see the print in the glass, uh, a, a similar effect. So let's get straight into some use cases. So the first is where you want um, a technician or an engineer. Oh, sorry, let me just mention uh, one other important thing. The glasses, as a general rule, have a forward-facing camera. And that means that they, uh, as, a di as a connected computer, can understand where they are in the world. Um, and that means that the digital information that they show you can be contextually relevant to what it is that you're looking at. So an example of that would be in asset validation or condition surveying. Um, so this is where you want a technician to look at an asset. In this case, it's a mast. Um, this mast is actually in CIX uh, in, in, um, in Cork. Um, and the glasses recognize it by seeing a QR code or a barcode or a serial number on the mast and showing digitally or um, contextually relevant information about that particular mast. I'll show you a video of this at the end. Um, what you get, uh, another, you know, other ways that you could do this is um, in checklists or procedures. So this is where you want a worker to step through a step-by-step -step procedure um, and you want the, to facilitate them doing it more quickly, more accurately, and more safe, as, uh, safely than before. And even more importantly, you want them to record the information of what it is that they saw. 
So again, I'll show you a video of this in a few moments. But what you can do is have the step-by-step -step procedure laid out for the worker. So they watch a short video or image of how to do step one. Then they can click next and move on to the next step. As they go, they can also take images or videos to validate what it, that they did the job correctly. Um, another and particularly relevant at this point in time application is remote advisor video calling or remote assistance. So what you see here, <coughs> this chap is wearing a pair of augmented reality glasses and we can see what he's seeing here because the forward facing camera is switched on. But you can see that there's a red box uh, uh, drawn around the electricity meter here. What's happened here is his colleague who's elsewhere in the office or the world can see what he's seeing in real time, can speak to him through the glasses, but also can annotate what he's seeing. So is drawing this red box, which this worker is seeing to highlight what actions he wants him to take. So this is a much better way of communicating uh, for troubleshooting, for auditing. At the moment, a lot of uh, our work is around factories who need um, to do FDA audits or things like that, or um, testing new equipment which is being installed. All of these sorts of applications are particularly relevant at this point in time. An example of a company using this, Takeda. Takeda is one of the largest pharmaceuticals in the world. They've got three production sites in Ireland. Um, and what they uh, are doing is they've got lots of restricted areas where uh, there are clean rooms or, or, or other uh, areas like that where you need to get garbed up. It's quite hard to go in and out of. And they were having trouble uh, providing support to the manufacturing team with engineering or IT or things like that, because an IT guy would have to get all garbed up. Now they can solve these problems very easily. They're also doing procedures using this technology. Uh, uh, one final application I'll speak of is design. So this is where you can see 3D models um, <clears throat> projected in front of you, and those can be overlaid in the real world. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to switch over to a video. We all have our videos. Uh, mine will be quite quick, and it'll show you some of these applications actually happening. So as, as I was saying, with increased complexity, it's important to figure out how to provide the information that a worker needs to get their job done. And the best place to provide that information is when they're actually at the point of doing the job. So here we see remote advisor, remote video calling happening, where this lady in the lab is being guided by her colleague elsewhere in the world. He can see on his computer what she's doing, and he's drawing annotations. This is a similar application in a data center and a similar application in an offshore rig or a similar application in engineering. Her colleague can see what she's doing and talk her through how to fix it. Here we see a procedure being completed on how to change the role in this um, industrial printer. So he's watching short little video clips on how to do each step, and then he's taking action to do the step. A similar application in a electrical switchgear application, he can watch a video and it's being described to him verbally what to do. Each video is only five or 10 seconds long, and then he completes the action that's required. Or a similar activity going on in a lab. This lady is watching step-by-step step how to do this particular task. And then I talked about scanning of things. So here, you can see there's a QR code on this ingredient, and the, or here there's a number, and in each case, the glasses are validating, is that the correct one or not? In this case, it's recognizing this piece of uh, industrial equipment, 
and it's showing contextually relevant, in some cases, live data about that particular asset. Now, as you can imagine, you can combine these three use cases that I just spoke about, whereby you can get the glasses to recognize an asset, confirm it's the correct one, and then show step-by-step -step procedures on how to do things. And if the worker encounters a problem, you can um, do a live call to troubleshoot whatever issue they encountered. I'm happy, I, I've been quite short because I realize our time is short and we're over time. Um, but I'm happy to take further questions now in the Q&A or speak to you. You can contact me on any of these sorts of um, numbers or email address or go, go to our website um, to give you any further information. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. That's great.